and welcome to the Northwest Chamber Alliance's U.S. Senate campaign event with Senator Cory Gardner. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to Senator Gardner for taking a few minutes while you're in session. My name is Scott Cook. I'm the CEO at the Longmont Chamber, and the Longmont Chamber is proud to host this event today in partnership with our Northwest Chamber Alliance. The Boulder Chamber will host a second event on October 15th with former Governor John Hickenlooper. The Northwest Chamber Alliance is a coalition of seven chambers, and it represents 3,600 businesses with 370,000 employees. I'd like to introduce my colleagues at the representing representative chambers, and then I'll go over a few notes on the format of this event. So we'll go in alphabetical order. Um, so we'll start with the Boulder Chamber, John in Boulder. Hi, John Tare, I'm president and CEO of the Boulder Chamber, and I first thank Scott for hosting this event today, and I also just am really appreciative of the Senator being with us, so thank you. Great, thanks, John. And from Broomfield, Sam Taylor. Thank you very much, Scott. I, I too appreciate the Longmont Chamber. And Senator uh, Gardner, thank you for being here. Your staff has always been very accessible to the Broomfield Chamber, and uh, we really appreciate it. So thanks for being here. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, and with the Latino Chamber at Boulder County, we have Pete Salas. Uh, good morning, Senator Gardner. My name is Pete Salas, and I'm the current chairperson for the Latino Chamber of Commerce. We, uh, we are a countywide chamber here in, um, uh, uh, we, right now we have, uh, we have a virtual office. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but we represent a number of uh, businesses, Latino professionals in Boulder County. Thank you very much for uh, agreeing to appear uh, with us this morning. It's much appreciated, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. And in Superior, we have TJ Sullivan. Senator Gardner, I'm TJ Sullivan, the executive director up in Superior. It's good to be on a call with a healthy senator. I hope you're doing well. <laughs> All right, and today we also have the Lafayette and Louisville Chambers uh, joining us. Vicki and Shelley were not able to join us, but we appreciate uh, their members. Many of their members are joining us um, for today's conversation. Uh, so I wanted to uh, point them out as well. All right, thank you. We will now do a quick review of our agenda and the ground rules for uh, today. Uh, today, we'll start with an introduction and an update from Senator Gardner. After that, I will ask each chamber leader to ask one question from the me membership. And then if time allows, we will take some questions from the audience submitted through the Q&A function. When we get to that part, I will ask Andrea from the Boulder Chamber to read aloud the questions. Please note, we are asking that all guests respect the time that each one of us is giving to this important conversation. The Q&A and chat is being actively monitored by chamber staff and we will dismiss participants if we feel it's necessary. And then if we have unanswered questions, those will all be forwarded to the campaign for follow-up. And I should note also today that the event is being recorded. All right, let's get started with the conversation. Corey Gardner is from Yuma and was elected to the Senate in 2014. He serves on the Commerce, Science and Transportation Committee, the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and is chairman of the Foreign Relations Subcommittee on East Asia, the Pacific, and International Cybersecurity. He has authored 10 bills that were signed into law, more than the entire Colorado, Colorado congressional delegation. He's been ranked the third most bipartisan member of the Senate by the nonprofit Luger Center in Washington. In the last few months, in addition to working with Governor Polis to secure hundreds of thousands of COVID tests and PPE through his relationships with his allies in Asia, Corey's Great American Outdoors Act was signed into law. This is the biggest public lands bill in 50 years and one of the largest investments in our, park and our in our parks in our nation's history. And most recently, Corey's 988 suicide hotline legislation passed Congress and will soon be signed into law. All right, Senator Gardner, thank you again for joining us today. Well, Scott, thank you for hosting this today and thanks to the Alliance for making this uh, possible. It's great to be with you and your membership as well. Uh, as you know, Longmont, uh, all of your communities hold a special place in my heart, but Longmont in particular, uh, if you go on to Main Street in, Long in Longmont, there is a plaque on the sidewalk that it pays homage to the 19, I think it's 1919 Longmont mm -hmm. High School National Championship football team. And if you look closely, there is a name on there. Rankin Archer uh, is my great grandfather. He was uh, uh, playing on that team in Longmont. Uh, and so I, every time we go to Longmont, I love to uh, show the kids uh, that at least somebody in their family was a good athlete. Uh, so it's kind of fun to see it. Uh, so thanks to all of you for, for your time today. Look, I've worked hard over the last six years to make sure that we're creating more opportunity, uh, a better country, stronger jobs, 
and, and greater lives uh, enriched uh, through the work that we all do uh, for every single corner of this state. Uh, six years ago, when I was elected to the Senate, I talked about creating economic opportunity, and we have done that. Uh, and prior to the pandemic, and I'll get into the pandemic, prior to the pandemic in Colorado, between 2018 and 19, we saw uh, some of the highest wage growth, household income growth in the country right here in the West. We saw 7% increases in household income as a result of our tax cuts. In 2017, we passed a series of tax cuts that creates opportunity zones across our, our, our state and our country. If you work in an opportunity zone, your wages are growing about 8% faster than they are if you're not in an opportunity zone. And many of these opportunity zones are in our rural areas and our uh, economically distressed areas. So it's empowering people with better jobs. Our, our, our work on regulatory reform and uh, allowing people to keep more money in their own pockets has resulted in nearly $2,000 household uh, income increase thanks to uh, that effort. So we saw record low unemployment rates. In fact, I know we've talked many times times at chamber meetings about how that was a challenge uh, for uh, such a low uh, unemployment rate. But as a result, you know, Colorado has been leading, uh, leading the country when it comes to jobs, investments, and innovation. And I've been honored to help be a part of that and to help Colorado innovators, entrepreneurs, and communities thrive uh, to, to get to where we are, the greatest state uh, in this United States. Uh, and that was before the pandemic. And the pandemic has created new pressures on all of us. And we have to get back to that record of success. Through the pandemic, there are three things that I have focused on. Number one is making sure that we uh, address the, the health crisis itself, flattening the curve, stopping the spread. It's why I supported efforts to increase funding for vaccines and therapies and treatments and personal protective equipment stockpiles and new ways to provide treatment to uh, people across this country. It's why the second thing, of course, we have to do is to make sure that we are helping individuals who have lost their jobs, who've seen hours reduced. That's why I supported extending unemployment benefits. That's why I supported most recently legislation to extend unemployment benefits through the end of the year. And I know uh, there are people who say that, you know, that's keeping people out of the workforce, but we have to help people. We make sure that it's not a disincentive, but we have to make sure that we are helping everyone be able to make ends meet, whether that's rent, whether that's their mortgage, whether that's their car payments. We have to make sure that we take care of people. The third thing, of course, uh, the lens who I filtered all my actions through uh, is making sure that we help businesses so that we can keep their doors open, that we can keep people hired and we're able to survive through this. You know, this isn't an instance where a restaurant was serving bad food and they closed. It's not an instance where a hotel had a dirty room and nobody wanted to go to it. No, this is where our mayors and our governor and the president said, you're going to socially distance, you're going to shut down, you're going to reduce capacity out of love for our community to stop the spread of the virus. And that means we have to be there to get our country back open again and back to work. And that's exactly what I continue to do. It's why I was one of the chief proponents and developers of the Paycheck Protection Program. It's why I want to expand the Paycheck Protection Program to get another draw on that loan to continue to help businesses. We've put over $10 billion into Colorado through the Paycheck Protection Program. It saved hundreds of thousands of employees and we need to make sure that that work continues, along with help for child care assistance, along with help for education dollars in local community and state and local government funding. I continue to push for those. Uh, Scott, you mentioned at the very beginning of the call that I have uh, passed more legislation into law than the entire Colorado congressional delegation combined. Uh, that's true. Uh, the Great American Outdoors Act has been described as the holy grail of conservation measures, a, a great bipartisan victory uh, for the American people that will create thousands of jobs, redoing trails, working on our campgrounds, and fixing our visitor centers uh, across uh, our forests and national parks. It's the 988 bill that you just described we lose tragically in Colorado. Uh, somebody every seven hours, uh, death by suicide. Uh, and just like you can call 911 to report a fire, you can call 988 for that mental health need to prevent and to reach somebody to prevent uh, that suicide. Uh, it will have specialized veterans uh, care. It focuses on how do we reach our LGBTQ community to make sure that they are receiving help uh, because of the disproportionate effect that they have uh, in our, our suicide uh, tragedies across this country. So we need to make sure that, that we are, are focused on those results. I'm the third most bipartisan member of the United States Senate for a reason, because I believe that when you start with Republican and Democrat support, when you start with it, you end with it as well. If you start with only Democrat or only Republican support at the beginning, it becomes more and more difficult to get there by the end. You can do it, but why, why not start with the very beginning 
the ground entry, Republican and Democrat supporting measures uh, for the betterment of this country. Look, I'm going to fight for every nook and cranny of this state. I live in a tiny town in the eastern plains of Colorado. In fact, I'm using the home office today in a house that once belonged to my great-grandparents. We have a family business here. We sell farm equipment. I learned about business there. I learned what it takes to create jobs and opportunity. I learned about the needs of others and how we can serve others so they can empower our communities. We're going to get through this pandemic together. We're going to rise above it together. And in Colorado, we always look to that great horizon. We always look to Long's Peak and see what's next and beyond so that we can get to that next great opportunity. Never looking back. I was raised to believe that there is opportunity and optimism in every veil and valley. And we have to work hard together to find it. But that's what Colorado does. So it's an honor to be with all of you as we get through this together, as we create new opportunities together, and as we fight for all four corners of our state to succeed. So Scott, thanks. And I'm looking forward to, to your questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we'll uh, go in alphabetical order again uh, and take questions from each of the leadership uh, at the leadership at each chamber. So uh, we'll start with John Tear in Boulder. Yes, Senator. Uh, first of all, I appreciate uh, your comments about bipartisanship and uh, obviously the efforts around addressing the pandemic, which is critical to getting our economy up and running. But I will say there's another issue that is of great importance to our innovation economy. And that is immigration and, and some of the challenges that we've faced in reaching a bipartisan solution around how to better open the gates to uh, the types of leadership and, and innovators that we need in our businesses to drive our, our um, economy. So just wondering as you're approaching now then going forward to um, uh, seeking a second term, what is your proposal and vision for improving our immigration system? Yeah, thank you, John, for the question. You know, if you think about uh, it, most of us came to Colorado or to the United States from somewhere else. And I oftentimes think about what I would do uh, if uh, my family was somewhere else around the globe, anywhere else but the United States, that I would do everything in my power to get my family into this great country for the opportunities uh, that it stands for, the values that we share. No matter where I was, I'd be doing everything I could to be here. So recognizing that, recognizing that we are a nation of immigrants, that we can empower uh, the, the best of innovations when we draw those brightest minds here, that we are made richer in our lives, in our communities, in our schools, in our arts, in our faith, and everything about us by having that diversity of community around us. How do we have an immigration system that works? Here, here's, uh, here's what we need to do. Number one, if you go back several years ago, I worked closely with Senator Bennett from Colorado to create a bipartisan gang of six proposal that brought uh, elements of, of uh, the DREAM Act together, to pass the DREAM Act, to put our young children on that uh, path to citizenship because they were brought here at, at, uh, through no fault of their own at a very young age. Let's fix that. Let's make it right. We put money into border security so that we can have the, the judges and the fixes at the, at the border so we avoid the tragedies that we've seen under the Obama and Trump administrations uh, so that we make sure that we have the necessary resources to make our entry and exit systems, uh, entry exit systems work and our visas uh, work. We have 42% of the people who are here without documentation in the country who overstay the visa. Let's fix that. We're smart. We know how to do it. Uh, during that immigration debate on the floor of the United States Senate, I was the only Republican who voted for every single immigration reform, whether it was a Democrat reform or a Republican reform or the bipartisan proposal that we brought forward with the Gang of Six idea. We have to make this system work. As a result of my immigration proposals that would fix the exit entry system, pass the DREAM Act, address security, fix the asylum issues, stop family separation, under those ideas, I received an award from the National Immigration Forum called the Courage to Lead Award. And I received that award standing next to the second highest ranking Democrat in the United States Senate, Dick Durbin. Senator Durbin from Illinois said about me that it takes courage to be a Republican and do what I did. And I think that's important that we find those bipartisan solutions to immigration. That's what I fought for. That's what I've stood for. And that's what I, what I will continue to seek to achieve, bring both people, uh, both the sides of the aisle together so that people are first. And we have that great idea of a nation of immigrants, a nation of laws, but one that comes together uh, to make our country better than ever. 
All right, we'll next go to uh, Broomfield. Sam Taylor, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Senator Gardner, thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. Really, really appreciate your opening comments, um, especially your support of the extended unemployment benefits. Um, as Scott mentioned in the opening, the, the Northwest Chamber Alliance, we represent over 300,000 employees, somewhat less since March uh, because of COVID. Many of these people are unemployed through no fault of their own, not even the business at fault. As you uh, uh, pointed out, a lot of hotels, they don't need the staff. A lot of the restaurants are unable to have the people. Um, Broomfield is not in the Boulder area when it comes to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We're in the Denver Aurora Broomfield area is what it's called. And our employment numbers are still down 4.6% from um, early March. I mean, that's much better than the 10% we were down in April, but it's still really high. And many economists are predicting it's going to go back up as the cold weather hits. Yeah. Um, if you were crafting the next stimulus bill all by yourself with not a single person putting in and you knew it would pass, what would you do for extended unemployment benefits and how much extra uh, federal money would you put into those per week? Uh, Sam, thank you very much. I think we have to look at this instance and recognize the help that people need. I mean, there are people who are hurting, people who put their lives, their blood, their sweat, their tears into their families, their homes, their businesses, and they've seen it just been wiped out. And they want to work. They want to be able to be uh, back in it. And we have to make sure that they can. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I think oftentimes about uh, something that I heard uh, Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, say to me in a conversation I had about what tools we needed to, uh, to create and secure so that we get through this. And he said, you know, at the end of the year, if you look back and you say, gee whiz, the economy is fantastic, unemployment is the lowest it's been, and jobs are being created left and right, but I wish we wouldn't have spent that much money. What, 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 a, what, a, what a great thing that would have been. But if we look back at that moment and say, gee, the economy still isn't moving, and people still aren't at work, and people are hurting, and I wish we would have spent more, that is a bad, bad, bad recipe uh, for, for, for moving forward. So we need to make sure that we get people forward. So what would I do? Number one, I'm going to ask my staff who is on this call uh, to send everyone a link and maybe they can do it either uh, now or, or later. Uh, in April, April 16th, I believe it was, I signed a letter with Senator Bennett uh, and Governor Polis, a joint letter between the three of us, outlining the things that we needed to continue to do uh, to, produ to provide uh, stimulus, to provide help for our economy. It included uh, continued support for businesses. It included support for underserved and unserved businesses, getting minority businesses access to uh, paycheck protection program loans and other uh, resources. Uh, it included assistance to Medicaid. And just the other day, I convinced the, uh, the, the, the White House to extend uh, the, the public health emergency so that we can continue the expanded uh, Medicaid benefits through the pandemic. Um, you know, we need help for state and local governments, additional dollars for uh, state and local governments with flexibility uh, to be used for those expenses, uh, to put additional dollars into education needs, to put additional dollars into nutritional needs for our families, uh, to provide additional benefits on unemployment. What does that look like? What I just supported was a, a, a measure that would extend unemployment benefits through the end of the year. Uh, that's the expanded unemployment benefits through the end of the year. Uh, I support that. And we may need to look at that and say, you know what, we're going to have to do more as we go forward. Like I said, we're not going to create a disincentive to work. We're going to make sure that people are active, productive part of our economy. We need this next package to have that Paycheck Protection Program expansion in it. We need to make sure that people can get a second loan on it. And yeah, we ought to look at revenues because if you're doing better than you ever have, you probably don't need that Paycheck Protection Program loan. But there's a lot of businesses that aren't. And you know what? Let's help them. Let's find that targeted relief. We need dollars to continue on the vaccine side. We need dollars to continue on the research side, the personal protective equipment side. So all of that needs to be in this. Now, we just had a vote a couple of weeks ago on the floor of the Senate that would have provided uh, well over $100 billion for education, which is more than the, the House bill had proposed. Uh, it provided uh, dollars, uh, I think $10 billion for the U.S. Post Office. 
Uh, it provided dollars for child care, billions for child care needs, because you, you have parents who are struggling to get to work. And if their kids are at school, that's one thing. But if they're online learning at home, that's another thing. And so we need to provide some help there. It provided dollars for vaccines. It provided dollars for a, a personal protective equipment. It would have expanded the unemployment benefits through the end of the year. It would have opened up, expanded the, the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, and more. Uh, and so that would have had some liability uh, precautions in there as well. Look, th that bill had more than a majority of support. It had 52 votes for it. So more than a majority necessary. Unfortunately, there was a filibuster against it and it took 60 votes uh, to pass it because there was a filibuster against it. Uh, so it fell eight votes shy uh, of, of passing. I, I hope we can find those eight votes. I hope that people will be willing. I, I realize that everything I laid out to you that I want, not everything that I want is in that bill, but I realize that providing unemployment benefits to people now, providing help and relief to businesses now, providing billions of dollars in education now matters and that we should pass it, get it through and start working on the next thing. There is no alpha and omega coronavirus bill that is going to be the end all be all. You never need to look at it again. We're going to have to keep working on this for years to come. Let's help now and continue to help going forward. So thank you very much for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Senator. Uh, we'll next go to Pete uh, Salas at the Latino Chamber. Thank you again, Senator Garner. I have, a, I have, I have so many questions, but <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna limit it uh, uh, to uh, uh, a business question. Uh, yeah. There are, uh, Senator, there are over 5 million uh, small business, small Latino businesses in our country, including thousands uh, here in Colorado. I, there are over 4,800 here in Boulder County. And uh, the question I have is, what what are you doing to ensure uh, that uh, these businesses are uh, are are benefiting by, uh, from federal and state contracts? And uh, given the uh, perceived inequities uh, in in the business community around. Uh, distribution of federal funds to minority businesses. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I'm gonna I talk right now about uh, the, the, the contracting, then remind me to talk to you about uh, uh, the, the, the coronavirus relief packages too, because I think that goes into part of this. Uh, so I have uh, a, 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 um, a group of people in Colorado Springs that are very familiar uh, with government contracting issues uh, that have created sort of a, a, a working group uh, to help reach out across the state of Colorado. Uh, to small businesses uh, and minority businesses, uh, underrepresented communities to help gain access to, uh, to contracting with the federal government, uh, whether that's the Defense Department, whether that's uh, the Commerce Department or others, really trying to get them into the door, uh, breaking down barriers and you know, getting on the phone and talking to the federal agencies about, hey, uh, can, you, can you spend some time visiting with this uh, individual, this organization, this business and using their expertise uh, because they have so much experience on uh, contracting to really help cut through uh, the, that challenge that a small business has when it comes to federal contracting, and especially minority-owned businesses when it comes to it. So we're constantly looking at ways to reduce the red tape and, the ch and the, some of the uh, ingrained uh, inertia against the small business access uh, to those contracts and trying to tear down those barriers uh, so that we can get more into uh, contract signed uh, minority-owned businesses, uh, you know, small businesses across the state of Colorado. Uh, but it's also s sort of emblematic of the work that we had to do uh, with the coronavirus relief. You know, when the Paycheck Protection Program went out, it, it was limited to uh, basically banks uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, loans through the SBA program, uh, the 7A kind of lenders. Uh, and so we worked hard to make sure that uh, that we got non-traditional uh, lenders into the program as well. So CDFI lenders, CDC lenders uh, for communities that were either unbanked, underbanked, or didn't have a traditional banking relationship uh, to make sure that minority owned businesses, areas that were less served had access and people who were providing that kind of economic relief and economic opportunity. And, and, and so really that kind of ties in with the same work we're doing on the contracting side to get more people involved uh, to, to get into that contracting. That's what I'm gonna continue to do and we need to make sure that we expand those opportunities as well. Opportunity zones uh, create additional, uh, additional hope for us uh, to, to get into under, uh, undeveloped, underdeveloped areas, economically uh, distressed areas, uh, to make sure that we have more investments, uh, 70 some billion dollars now going into those opportunity zones. 
Uh, we have a lot of focus on the real estate side of Opportunity Zones, and that's good because it's helping with uh, you know, affordable housing issues, but we also now need to help it on the job creation side as well in Opportunity Zones, and I think that will help too uh, for small business and minority-owned businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much, thanks. Great, thanks Pete. We will next move to the Superior Chamber and TJ Sullivan. Senator Gardner, just since we started this uh, phone call, the Defense Department announced that General Mark Milley, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, along with several of the Pentagon's most senior uniformed uh, leaders are being quarantined after being exposed to the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Reports are the West Wing is a ghost town today. Um, and we have senators, several, what, three, four senators that are either quarantined or have been exposed to COVID. My question is, is your sense that we are moving into a phase where this coronavirus pandemic is actually affecting our country's ability to, to operate uh, effectively, particularly around our national security apparatus? Are, are we entering a new zone where we need to be concerned about that? No, uh, look, our country is strong and our leadership is strong and our, our military is, uh, uh, is, is vastly, vastly uh, prepared for this. Uh, they have had contingencies in place long before uh, coronavirus, uh, and certainly at the very beginning of this pandemic, they began to uh, create national security directives and efforts uh, within uh, the Department of Defense and the White House to uh, plan for uh, contingencies when top leaders may be quarantined, quarantined or indeed themselves uh, be tested positive for this. And so, uh, but obviously we have to do more uh, when it comes to preparing the country and the state uh, and our nation for and through this pandemic and whatever pandemic comes again, because it will. So there's a couple things that we need to build on right now. Number one, we need additional relief that we have talked about here. Uh, that is going to help our men and women in uniform respond. That's gonna help our, uh, our, our federal workforce respond. That's certainly gonna help our states and all of the citizens of this country. Number two, we need to make sure that we pass uh, legislation that I've introduced along with Senator Bennett, uh, my colleague from Colorado, a bill called the TEST Act. The TEST Act is a national plan uh, for diagnostics and testing that coordinates with local public health departments, state and federal government to identify hot spots before they become outbreaks. We need that plan implemented. Uh, that is in uh, some of the legislation that we have uh, had in the Senate. It's been incorporated in there. We need to get that bill passed as soon as possible. We need to continue the efforts we have on vaccinations, th treatments, and therapies. Uh, you can see the reports today that that, you know, about, uh, you know, the advancements that we have made in treatments and therapies uh, with, you know, steroids for breathing conditions, the blood thinners for the clotting conditions, the way that people are positioned if, if they have to go to the hospital on a ventilator, the outcomes of being in a prone position, the swimmer's position versus on their back, and uh, the, the, how, how better the treatment results are. In that case, remdesivir, that's the Ebola antiviral drug that has had a significant uh, uh, shown significant promise uh, throughout the country in that treatment. Uh, those all things, that matters in terms of how we make sure that the government is able to uh, respond uh, for the people, number one, but also to keep itself in operation. Uh, but uh, look, this, this country has been through a number of challenges before. Uh, and uh, this is something unlike we've seen in our lifetime. Uh, but I, I am confident uh, that our people and our nation will get through this. And I'll, uh, obviously, if that news just broke, I had not seen that uh, during this, uh, this call, but I'll make sure that I check into that. I just spoke yesterday uh, to Secretary Esper, the Department of Defense uh, Secretary. We were talking about Space Command, we were talking about some Air Force Academy issues, and then we got into discuss some discussions about force protection efforts. You know, force protection efforts, yes, it means making sure that we protect the, the people on base and, uh, you know, whether it's somebody trying to do harm to them, but it's also their health. And what we are doing on the front lines of health for our men and women in uniform, that is, begins with the, uh, the, the very new entrance into uh, enlistee, into the military, uh, to the most senior of four stars uh, that we have representing our country. All right, thanks, TJ and the Senator. Uh, we'll now go to Andrea. Andrea, I can see some of the chat. I'm not sure if I can see all of it. So do we have any questions uh, that have come in from from the audience? Yeah, Scott, we have um, some questions uh, that have been asked by some members of our business community. And I'll go ahead and uh, ask each one of those to Senator Gardner. Uh, Senator Gardner, one question we have from a small business owner is that one of the greatest challenges they face is the cost and uncertainty around health insurance. 
Health insurance costs are inhibiting the competitiveness of American workers and employers. What are you doing to ensure health care is accessible and affordable? Well, thank you. I can remember several years back when uh, at the, at the uh, Implement dealership uh, that we had, I think it was a $70,000 year-to-year increase in our health insurance costs. Uh, and we don't have hundreds of employees. We have dozens uh, at any given time uh, or just a dozen, uh, depending on how good the year is. Uh, and, you know, that challenge, that $70,000 that we knew was important for our employees, but it also was one less piece of equipment that we could invest in for uh, expansion of the business or one less person that we could hire for uh, investing into the business. So we have to make sure that we, that we increase the quality of care and we decrease the cost of care. There are two things that, uh, that Republicans and Democrats agree on. Number one, we will always and make sure we always have coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. Number two, uh, we have to recognize the need uh, to fix what we got and to actually put something in place that is going to work to drive down the cost of healthcare. So how do we do that? Number one, we need a, uh, we need a, a, a patient-centered healthcare system between the patient and their doctor. We need to have a reinsurance uh, system set up, risk pools set up that drive down the cost of uh, healthcare for those high-cost individuals, making sure that they have affordable care, but also making sure that insurance stays affordable for everyone. We need more competition. In Colorado, uh, there are 22 counties that only have one provider to choose from. I worked with Governor Polis to get a waiver for the state on reinsurance to help drive down costs. I eliminated the health insurance tax that will save individuals and families in Colorado hundreds of dollars a year in their health insurance costs. We need association health plans. Uh, for me, we sell red tractors. Our neighbors sell green tractors. Why can't we have the, a, a common insurance policy? Because we all have salespeople, we have service people, uh, and we have uh, you know, the, the, the parts managers and service managers. They're basically doing the same thing. One's green, one's red. Why can't we have one insurance policy through an association that would help us work on that? We need liability uh, reforms. It's estimated that as, as much as 25% of our healthcare costs are unnecessary procedures. Uh, and so let's figure out a way uh, to do that. Let's address technology in a way that empowers individuals to make better choices for their health care, uh, that allows them to shop using an iPhone based on the best outcome at the best price. Uh, we can do that through health savings accounts and through business and employer settings. And we can also make sure that we have price transparency. If you look right now uh, at a car, you can go down to any car dealership. How much does this Ford cost at this dealership? How much does it cost at that dealership? And you know, we ought to be able to know the same thing on healthcare. Now, the big difference though, in, in you know, both, both Republicans and Democrats are gonna cover people with preexisting conditions. Both want something better than what we have. The difference is in what, you, what, what that new uh, idea looks like. My idea is that patient-centered healthcare approach. The alternative is a, is a government-run system uh, a public option, sometimes a government-run system is called, or Medicare for all. It all results in the same things. In fact, they admit that it ends up basically in the government taking it over completely. That would devastate our rural hospitals. It would result in a $2,300 increase in payroll taxes, and it would eliminate 178 million people from the insurance they get through their employer. 178 million people would lose their insurance through their employer if they succeed. I don't think that that is a recipe for success. So those are just a few of the highlights of things that we need to do and a warning about some of the, the ideas out there as a replacement. Thank you, Senator Gardner. Uh, the next question is more along the lines of uh, race and equity. The person who submitted asks, Recently, Citigroup released a study that found the U.S. has lost about 16 trillion from the GDP due to, over the last 20 years, uh, race-based inequalities. What are your plans to address race-based uh, inequalities, and what can you do uh, from your seat in Congress? Well, thank you very much for that. I, you know, as we watched this summer, uh, we our, our souls and lives were touched in ways that perhaps that they never had been before as we watched the murder of George Floyd in real time over and over again. And we cannot let that moment be forgotten and nothing done when it comes to inequality, injustice, the unequal application of the law. And as it relates to an economic question, uh, the fact that you have economic uh, differences and inequities need to and must be addressed. So uh, what we have to do is, is um, uh, some of what we've uh, put in place and what needs to be done, uh, let's get into that. Uh, number one, uh, we have now mandatory 
mandatory funding for historically black colleges and universities. Uh, we have, uh, we, we, this is the first time it's ever been mandatory. We just passed that this past uh, Congress, this past year, uh, and that's going to provide more opportunities uh, for, uh, for uh, our communities uh, of color across this country too. We have to increase funding and opportunities for Hispanic serving institutions. Uh, we've had, uh, we, we need to continue the focus on that education opportunity uh, number three, uh, we have provided opportunity zones that I talked about before uh, that are particularly focused on distressed economic areas, many in predominant minority communities. If you are a worker, one of the lowest wage earners in this country, your wages are growing at about 8% faster than that non-opportunity zone worker. That is creating new opportunities for many minority communities uh, across the country. Uh, that is incredibly important that we continue that. We've also seen that we need to make sure that we're building on the successes of the 2017 tax cuts. If you look at the 2017 tax cuts and the economic progress we had prior to the pandemic, if you look at Hispanic families and you look at African-American families, Hispanic and African-American families' wealth grew 65% and 33% uh, as, as a result of the work that we have done. So we need to continue that uh, growth. We saw every sector of our uh, uh, wealth in this country grow, but it was 33% to African-American, 65% Hispanic communities, 3% uh, for the white communities. Uh, obviously the white communities started at a higher level. We need to make sure that that growth continues in the non-white communities so that we can have that equality uh, that is created. We need educational opportunities. We need more, uh, more opportunities for scholarships and grants and student loan uh, provisions. Uh, those are just a few of the things that we can do. Uh, you know, and when it comes to things like police reform, uh, I supported a measure uh, that Senator, Senator Tim Scott put forward on the floor of the Senate that would start uh, applying those basic ideas that we all know we need to do to follow the tracking systems of shootings and uh, in equal application of the law, how we can make sure that we investigate and stop that, the chronic hold kinds of things, the chronic hold kind of things that we've done changes at the state level on those police reform means so that we prevent those tragedies from happening. So I know I combined both the sort of some of the, the, the larger racial issues that we've seen over this past year, along with the economic issues, but all of them need to be addressed. And those are just, a, again, a few of the ideas that we have to work together uh, to make sure that we have opportunity, truly opportunity for all in this country. Thank you, Senator Gardner. Uh, another question that I um, am assuming all the chamber executives gathered here today are wondering about is the funding that organizations, especially membership-based organizations, have been waiting yeah. for, for Congress. Chambers are doing a lot of work in their communities to spearhead uh, the economic recovery efforts to help the small businesses thrive. And um, we're still waiting for some kind of congressional support to keep organizations such as ours uh, going and keeping our communities vibrant. What can you do to help uh, membership-based organizations and the 501c6 funding that's still being waited upon? Yeah, absolutely. You think about like the direct marketing organizations, you think about chamber of commerce organizations, you think about the work and the role that you play, the trade associations like the restaurant association. And I mean, my gosh, uh, not every business has a major marketing firm that can, you know, shift gears and figure out what to do. Not every business has the legal uh, you know, department that's going to figure out how to get through a, a I, you know, EIDL loan or a paycheck protection uh, application. So, uh, you know, we need to make sure that those chambers succeed, those trade organizations succeed because you're the ones that are helping guide small businesses to the resources and through the effort that it takes to, uh, to actually obtain those resources. So I commend you for the work that you have done in getting your membership connected with banks and lenders and other resources they need to help get through this together. So uh, I am a sponsor of legislation that would expand uh, these opportunities, the Paycheck Protection Program and others to uh, all nonprofits, uh, particularly C6s. When the CARES Act was introduced back in March, it actually did apply to all nonprofits, at least I, I think it applied to everyone. And then when it passed, for whatever reason, that was changed, and that's where that restriction came in. Uh, and so we did have some legislation on the floor that would have opened it up uh, to, uh, to other organizations outside of that. Unfortunately, it fell shy of the votes that we needed to get it done, but it had more than enough uh, to pass had it not been filibustered. Uh, we need to continue uh, to, to fight to get that done because your role is saving businesses each and every day. Thank you. That's encouraging and we'll keep it up. Uh, we just need Congress to help us out and we're glad that you'll be there to, uh, to help us with that or that you're there today. 
Um, Senator Gardner, we have a question um, coming in from the Boulder County Farmers and the Boulder County Farmers are asking, relief funds for farmers have primarily benefited large industrial operations. Will you help direct relief to smaller operations in our communities by sponsoring a companion bill to the Local Farmer Act introduced in the House? Yeah, so I'll take a look at the Local Farmer Act. Uh, and uh, uh, I spoke to Secretary Purdue about relief issues in Colorado in general. Uh, a couple things that Colorado is affected by, uh, a lot of the relief uh, seem to be more Midwest and South based. Uh, and, uh, you know, we need to make sure that that is getting all the way to, uh, to our states like Colorado and in the West. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, one of the, my concerns, whenever you have a Secretary of Agriculture or a chairperson of a Senate or House Ag Committee, their regional perspective can really define how they apply uh, the, the, the policies when it comes to agriculture. If you have a, if a cotton or corn or soybean base, then perhaps you don't know as much about wheat or vegetable farming or some of the other uh, produce opportunities we have in Colorado. Uh, and so, so, you know, that's a conversation I've long had with Secretary Purdue, somebody who is more Southern agricultural focused. Uh, same thing with the, with the Forest Service part of USDA. So uh, I have talked to Secretary Purdue about these relief efforts, making sure it's getting to small farms, not just big farms. Uh, I'll take a look at the bill that you talked about. But, you know, I'm the only, you know, I'm the only member of Colorado's statewide delegation. I'm the only statewide elected official in Colorado who lives in rural Colorado. Uh, I'm the only statewide elected official who has an agriculture background uh, right now uh, and uh, that lives in rural Colorado that has a, it lives in a farming community with big farms, small farms, and everywhere in between. Uh, and agriculture remains the cornerstone of our economy. And we have to make sure that it's thriving in Boulder County. We have to make sure it's thriving in Baca County. Uh, and we have to make sure that it's thriving across all four corners of our state. All right, two more questions. We have one from um, the audience and then one from Pete Salas at the Latino Chamber. And then I'll turn it back to Scott Cook. Uh, from the audience, last question is, there has been unprecedented spending by federal government on virus-related efforts. This is burdening future generations with debt. How do you plan to get spending down, budgets balanced? Also, do you see that the virus spending will dictate future cuts in other important areas, uh, defense, for example? Well, well a couple things. Uh, you know, number one, we had a, a, a sort of a structural debt crisis before the pandemic, and it certainly didn't get made easier by the pandemic. But like I mentioned before, if we sit back in January and wish we would have done more uh, to provide relief, uh, it, it's too late. Uh, we have to do the relief now to get our economy to the position where we say, thank God we got through this together uh, with a thriving economy again. And we can and we will do that uh, with the measures that we have talked about today. Um, but we have to address that structural debt. Uh, you know, there are economists out there who believe that, uh, you know, that this is accretive spending, uh, but no matter what and however you want to categorize it, who economists, uh, what economist says what, we have to address it. So there's uh, several things we need to do. Number one, I firmly believe in a constitutional balanced budget amendment. We have to have it. There will be exceptions, obviously, for emergencies like now. Number two, we need to make sure that we have a, a, a tax policy, a regulatory environment that drives innovation and entrepreneurship and investments. If you think about the tax cuts that we have, it brought trillion plus dollars from overseas back into investments into this country. I talked about the household wage growth that we saw as a result of those tax cuts. That needs to continue. But we have to ramp up even more our economic growth because we cannot cut or tax our way out of this deficit and debt crisis. We growth, economic growth is key. And that's what we have to do is have those pro-growth economic policies like we've never seen before in order to get our economy back on this. We have to cut spending where it makes sense. Uh, we're gonna protect Medicaid, we're gonna protect social security, we're gonna protect Medicare, but we have to bring in healthcare reforms to make sure that we're lowering those costs like we've talked about today. We also have to make sure that we, we cut spending where it makes sense. Every year there's a report from the GAO that talks about duplicative government spending, billions of dollars where one office is doing the same exact thing as another office. I've got legislation with a Democrat uh, co-sponsor, Gary Peters of, of Michigan, to force congressional committees to actually look at the government duplication in spending. That would save billions and billions of dollars. Uh, so, so those are just a few of the things that we need to do. now. Um, if, if you don't address this challenge, the, the spending that we have now will affect everything, just as the spending prior to this will affect everything. Because 
Two thirds of our budget right now is on uh, autopilot mandatory spending. One third of our budget is discretionary, meaning that Congress has day to day control over it. But even at its even taking us out the pandemic, that gap was closing, that one third was disappearing, and eventually it would have been all mandatory spending, leaving nothing for roads and transportation and uh, agriculture and education. So we have to address it now. Otherwise, it will crowd into spending that we all know is very important, like expanding infrastructure, which we desperately need to do. Thank you, Senator Gardner. And Pete Salas from the Latino Chamber. Pete, you still there? Yeah, I just had, I was on mute. Uh, Senator Gardner, uh, the president has uh, uh, decided to eliminate uh, basically what are cultural competency classes for federal employees. Uh, one of the reasons he gives is that they are racist. My question is, do you believe that cultural competency classes for federal employees are racist and do you support his position as such? Well, thank you for the question. I need to, I, we, we need to make sure that we have culturally competent uh, federal employees. Uh, we don't need to have anti-American uh, lessons taught. I, I think there's a review of that to make sure that that's not the case. So absolutely move forward with cultural competence, but do so in a way that's pro-American, not anti-American. And I believe that uh, any kind of study to review that ought to make that determination. So let's have cultural competence, but let's make sure that it's uh, pro-American. And that's, uh, I think, what, what everybody would agree with. Senator right. Gardner, um, I'm being told that we have time for another question and one that's come in through the, uh, the Q and A's that on a topic we haven't addressed yet is climate change. Um, the person asks, right now we are currently seeing increased fires, not only in Colorado, but across the US West. This has and will continue to significantly disrupt the supply chain. What are you doing to address climate change? Yeah, climate change, obviously, climate change is real, and there's no doubt that uh, you know, global industrial activity uh, has, has impacted our climate. Uh, and uh, so just, I'll give you one example, that through the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, the NRDC said that my bill, the Great American Outdoors Act, addresses two of our most important issues facing the country. Number one, climate change. Uh, number two, uh, biodiversity of, of wildlife. And so that is one idea that uh, NRDC itself has recognized as an important step toward addressing climate change. I've also worked hard to make sure that we are increasing funding and we've actually I've led the increase of nearly 50% at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, in Golden, Colorado for clean energy and investments in battery storage technologies. Uh, and it is remarkable the work that they have done, the grid that's not too far away from Boulder, the Flatirons campus there, uh, where they have that, that, that microgrid that includes the, the wind turbine, it includes the batteries tied in, it includes a whole mox, well, in real life setup for how we can integrate an economy into a clean energy future. So we've increased that funding by nearly 50% there. Uh, I've also been uh, focusing on how we make our, uh, our, our country more energy efficient. I've introduced legislation to provide funding and investment tax credits for battery storage. I led the fight to preserve the production tax credits for solar and wind in our 2017 tax cuts. Uh, we've, you know, that's all going to go toward reducing emissions. Uh, and on the energy savings side, uh, I've led the, the effort to save about four to five billion dollars in, uh, in, in utility costs for the taxpayers by making our government buildings more e energy efficient. There's billions and billions more that we can do, creating private sector jobs, reducing the burden of the taxpayers by reducing their energy costs that they pay in their federal buildings. And uh, it endures obviously in less emissions that are being introduced. Uh, that's critically important as uh, those investments. So uh, that's what I continue to do. Uh, I helped form the Energy Efficiency Caucus uh, in the Senate and the House, uh, excuse me, in, in the House, uh, the performance contracting side. I've been part of a bipartisan working group in the Senate to address climate change and our environmental needs. But again, you look at something like the Great American Outdoors Act, uh, the biggest infusion of investment into our outdoors in the country's history, a Teddy Roosevelt-like accomplishment, I think is gonna go leaps and bounds uh, to help us address some of these most pressing environmental needs. Thank you, Senator Gardner. It looks like we have one more question from John Tayer. Then I will turn it back to Scott Cook. And if we have time for any issues that have not been raised, um, that's it from our interactive part with our, um, our members. Hey, Senator, uh, you alluded to this issue, but one that's really important to our businesses, and that is transportation infrastructure. Uh, I mean, you can just look at I-70 uh, during the weekends or just a traffic congestion into 
uh, Boulder County on US 36 and know that that's a crying need for our community for investment. So I'm wondering what plans would you have going forward for investment in transportation infrastructure? And also very importantly, how would you pay for that? Yeah, so thank you for that. Uh, over the last several years, I've brought back hundreds of millions of dollars uh, uh, in infrastructure funding to Colorado. Uh, it's uh, been put to use on Highway 36. It's been put to use on the expansion of I-25 North. I learned that I-25 North expansion means a different thing for, for Collins than it, and, and Longmont and Boulder than it does Colorado Springs, both of them say I-25 North expansion, and we've helped fund both I-25 North expansions from Colorado Springs uh, and uh, from, uh, from uh, you know, Brighton up to uh, the Fort Collins area, the needs in between. Uh, obviously, certainly the, the money that we put into the Highway 36 corridor, mass transit needs, and most recently uh, funded uh, the, a grant for the Roaring Fork Transit Authority up in the mountains, which is the largest rural mass transit authority in the country. Uh, and uh, so we need to have it all. We need to have highways and bridges. We need to have uh, roads and bridges. We need to have uh, mass transit systems, light rail and other ideas uh, put together uh, and to make it all work for everyone. So that's what we have folks on here. Here's how uh, I think we need to move forward. Uh, the Senate has passed a, a bipartisan uh, highway reauthorization out of the EPW committee, passed unanimously, Republicans and Democrats. We need to get that bill passed as soon as possible. We also need a bigger, broader infrastructure package uh, that is put to work. Uh, how do you fund it? I mean, there's a, a number of ways that people will consider funding it. Uh, one of the ways is to use the, the dollars coming in from overseas uh, for an infrastructure bank, the trillions of dollars that we can put back into use to develop billions of dollars that we can go forward with. That's one idea. Um, you have other ideas that uh, people are going to be putting forward. I think the U.S. Chamber of Commerce wants the Congress to consider a, a, a gas tax. I don't know if there's the support for it. this Congress. I doubt that there is, uh, but uh, those are uh, opportunities that we need to work on for a broader infrastructure package. Number one, we need it in Colorado uh, because of the economic, uh, just the, the population growth we've seen and the economic opportunities that we need to continue to enjoy. I did help change the law, pass legislation to make Colorado more competitive for grants based on the number of freight and cargo traffic in a state, we have a lot, so it makes us you know, a little bit more eligible for funding and population growth. So it makes us, based on our population growth, more, uh, more opportunities for us to actually get those dollars brought back to, uh, to Colorado. Uh, we need to continue focusing on uh, our drinking water systems, uh, our wastewater systems, and broadband infrastructure as well for unserved and underserved areas. That's part of our infrastructure needs. I've got a bill that would allow the FCC to advance fund uh, using uh, spectrum auction proceeds, uh, about $8 billion worth of uh, money uh, into broadband deployments, and that would help us all economically. But that infrastructure component is real. Uh, right now, we have a highway system uh, that is, uh, you know, one out of every five miles, I think, is, is terrible uh, condition. Uh, overall, I think it's rated C or less. We have to do better than that if we're going to continue to attract the best business and economic opportunities uh, uh, across the country. All right, thank you, John. And uh, all of our chambers and our alliance are doing a lot on transportation, so we appreciate that, Senator. We are um, a bit over time, so we thank you for the added time. I think we had 45 minutes, we're, we're, we're past that now. Um, is there anything else that you would like to, to share with us that um, was not, we went through quite a few different topics uh, today and a number of different questions, um, but is there anything else that you would like to share with our chamber group? Well, yes, yeah, certainly. You know, one of the other bills that I passed was a bill called the American Innovation and Competitiveness Act. And if you think about uh, the work that is done uh, in the areas that your chambers represent, a lot of research, uh, a lot of science, a lot of uh, engineering uh, takes place, uh, basic uh, research takes place. This bill dramatically increased authorization funding for the National Science Foundation and NIST, of course, which has a huge presence in Boulder. Uh, and uh, it, it focuses on getting more minority students, uh, underserved, underrepresented communities into the STEM fields. It helped, uh, you know, in fact, one of the uh, one of the scientists, leading scientists that we worked with to pass the American Innovation and Competitiveness Act actually said that this bill made science bipartisan again. And so I'm excited to continue that work of bringing people together for the opportunities that you, that you have created in some of the greatest communities uh, in the state. And because we know we already have the greatest state in the country, uh, they're the greatest communities in the country as well. So thank you for the work that you do, the jobs that you create, the communities that you represent. We're gonna get through our challenges by sticking together. Uh, and thanks for being a partner in that effort. Scott, thanks very much for the time today. 
Thank you very much, Senator. And I want to thank, um, thank you for your service to Colorado and to our country, especially during uh, this time. Also want to thank all of our uh, partner chambers and all of the people that joined us uh, this morning. So thank you for your support of your local chamber um, and for the Northwest Chamber Alliance. Uh, if you did submit questions that um, were unanswered, uh, Andrea is taking care of those and those will be sent to uh, the campaign um, and the Senator will uh, answer those. Uh, so we'll get that done for you. Um, I also mentioned that ballots will be out very soon, of course. And so um, this is a reminder uh, from your Northwest Chamber Alliance partners to get out there and vote. Well, it's not, and I'd be remiss to say, I'd be honored to earn your vote. So thank you very much. <laughs> There you go. Thank you, Senator, and thank you everyone for joining us today.